You wanna? <laughs> no worries, no worries. I will, I will give you your time, Andrea. No worries. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to a new Adobe Live session. Today, our hosting a super cool session with my guest, Andrea. How are you, Andrea? I'm very good. How are you? How's everyone? <laughs> Pretty good. So Andrea is a base is based in London. He's a photographer with experience in both corporate and freelance photography. He's always looking for different ways to look at things and to move away from photography stereotypes. And today we're gonna learn all about the magic he's gonna be creating on Lightroom, Photoshop, and all the editing. And he's gonna include some typography uh, tips as well. So I can't wait for you to see that. I just want to say before we start. A huge hello to all our community that is watching us right now in the live chat. We have a very busy chat today. Hi, Christy, Emma, Stuart, Oliver, um, Andreas, so many people over here. And if you are joining us from YouTube, do switch to behance.net slash live so we can take your questions, say hello to you, and you can just join the community here live. Um, and, and yeah, so Andrea, um, I'm super looking forward to see what you're going to show show us today. Um, uh, please uh, let us know uh, what's the image we're going to be working on today. Yeah, so we'll be basically showing how I created this image, um, which was created for the destination, imagination. So as you can see, it's just a normal frame, normal picture. And I've added this um, satellite look on top. So we're just going to go through the process on how I've edited, you know, the initial image and then go through the steps and, you know, just do a breakdown on how I created this image. Um, so, yeah, as a first step, I always start. This is the raw image, as you can see, very flat colors. So the first thing is to bring that image into Lightroom. And yeah, here we go. So the first thing I do is I'll add one of my presets. For this one, I'm going to go for AA or 4. Um, what I like to do is I like my images quite cold and I don't know, these images seems like there's, there was some snow on the floor. Actually, this was a couple of months ago in London. We had a bit of snow. So yeah. I'm going to sort of like go towards a, a more colder edit. Uh, so what I did, I just brought down the temperature and I'm already quite happy with it. Going to just bring out some details from the shadows and add some more saturation and bring down the highlights just so that we can get more details of the train um and that is pretty much it pretty much happy with what we already have um so what i'm gonna do is i'm gonna export the image and i'm gonna then put it into photoshop and you know get rid of all these distractions so like for example this guy's head um you know just clear up all the um the signs and then add my own writing on the signs Nice. Uh, before, we'll, uh, before we get into the technical details, I'm actually yeah. curious to see the story behind the, the photo that you took. Uh, one, was it taken last year? Uh, this was taken... Actually, we can probably go and have a look where... Uh, <laughs> you probably... You, took, you take so many photos. That you yeah, probably... I know. This, this is probably in January um, or February. We had some snow in London and I was testing out a new lens. Uh, it was an 85 1.4 from Sigma. And, you know, it's a very tight lens. So this is a, a DLR station in London. It's a train station in uh, close to Tower Bridge in London. And, yeah, so I just found this frame, which, you know, you can see these leading lines and stuff. Actually, if you go on my Instagram, you'll see exactly also what um, the location looks like more in depth. Um, on we, a actually real... have a, we actually have a question from Caroline here. Did you actually stand on the train tracks to take um, the photo? No, funny enough, these train tracks, um, this train, there is no driver. So it drives itself. So this is the last plot, the last train station. So as you can see on the on the tracks, there is a, a stop. So this is the end of the station. And then it will just go back on itself and, you know, go back through London again. So yeah. because it was the last station, I was able to stand in front of the, yeah, literally in front of the train where there is um, a very low barrier. So you can just you know lift up your hands and um see the train straight in front of you so nice and and we're seeing right now the at the final image or we're going to be working over that image right now um this is the final color grade now we're going to export this and put it into photoshop where we're going to just clean it all up i'm going to get rid of all these distractions nice. um, from the image and then after that 
we're going to add some more bits to the image. So you can do this in two ways. You can just export the image by going, you know, file export, or you can do shift command E. Oh, yeah. Or command D and it puts it directly into Photoshop. But I already have it open in Photoshop. So there is. So normally what I do is I'll go in with the spot healing brush or the clone stamp tool and go into the image and just get rid of all these bits. So for example, we're going to get rid of this guy. Sorry about that, but he's not going to make the cut. <laughs> and now with all these new, I mean, I know that, you know, Photoshop keeps updating their features and, and right now it's becoming even more easier. Uh, to oh do yeah. They've added the, especially the sky replacement tool is crazy. It, you can literally <laughs> select an area and, you know, with AI Photoshop on his own, will just, you know, understand where the sky is and just place a sky in there, which, I mean, it wasn't the hardest thing to do, but it's just, it's so simple now. And yeah, just, it amazes me every day what Photoshop can do, honestly. Yeah. It's like with, without it, it would be really hard to, well, at least for me to do the sort of stuff that I do. Uh -huh. um, so even this, like how simple is to remove, you know, unwanted object from your image. Um, I honestly, without Photoshop, I have no idea how I would do it. Back in the days, they'll have to probably manipulate the film to, you know, yeah. just get rid of everything. But in a digital form, yeah, I have no idea. If I didn't have Photoshop, I'll be a bit lost. <laughs> <laughs> Love that. We're going to have to take that quote from you and put it put it somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> the billboard. <laughs> um, so as you can see, I'm just getting rid of all the distractions because we'll be writing on the train. I just want to make sure the train is clean. And I don't know. I personally like my images to be quite polished. So I'm very picky on like, see all these spots, for example, you don't have to remove it, but for my own piece, I'm going to just go and remove it um, because, I don't know, I just hate seeing, um, you know, distractions. It will take away from the final image, I think. So, yeah, it makes all, sense. All these small images, all these small, um, yeah, bits and pieces. I'm going to go here and remove the same from here. You know, Andrea, while we're working here, I have a question from Christy who's asking if have you... Have you used edit and the cool feature in Lightroom Classic? So be, be, the reason she's saying that is because you don't need to export it out of Lightroom Classic. Uh, uh, she, she's just pointing out that that could be an option as well. Uh, not sure if you've used but that doing, before. Doing the same sort of, you can do the sort of like you can, um, with the clone stamp tool in Lightroom, you could do this sort of edits. Yeah. I just personally prefer it to do it in Photoshop because you have, you have the spot healing brush, which is, I think, a lot better as, as a tool, just because it doesn't clone something from the image. It just generates something brand new, you know. Yeah. Um, so I just prefer it, but obviously you can do it in Lightroom. I just think it's a lot more precise in Photoshop. Yeah, that's um, really interesting to know because like, we would love to to see how every artist work and, yeah. and, and uh, why they prefer specific apps or over others so, so that's really interesting to know yeah i think it's just about precision and also sometimes you just don't have anything in the in the image to copy you know what i mean so it's just better for the program to generate a completely different thing and um and yeah just put it where you need it um so yeah that that was pretty much it the image is now clear so we have sort of like a plain canvas to work with um, what I did, I went online, I just literally Googled um, LED uh, typography font, and I found this font called Cyber, which looks a lot like, um, you know, the sort of font that you find in a, on a platform. So what we'll do is... Yeah, we'll and just also like, this is kind of like an invitation for everyone to know that we do also have Adobe fonts, uh, yeah. which is like this crazy gallery of, of amazing options. Uh, so it is easier for, for like, in case you are looking for a specific font, uh, I understand that you would go for an external source, but I've, I've used like the, the collection that the Adobe apps have, and it's just like, it's crazy. Oh, yeah, there is so much in there. It's and it's just right there. You can, 
just go ahead and use it in your work. I think it's fascinating. Yeah, it's definitely the easier option. And um, yeah, it's great. Like for um, most things, I'll probably do that. Um, my, my... And how long have you been in the photography industry, Andrea? Was it out of like was it something that you grew, that you began from passion or for or did you get a job and you began how did it all start um honestly i it started because um i didn't like my job i used to be a store manager uh, for a company and you know i just found myself a bit frustrated on the everyday work so photography for me i just picked up a camera and photography for me was an outlet to you know just create um and, you know, just express myself because I wasn't too well with the rest of my life. Photography was just my outlet and just slowly progressed into it and, you know, just went out and shooting every day. I sort of kind of slowly find my voice, uh, you know, shooting in London every day. And, you know, I've sort of started loving urban photography and grew my social media account from that. And I slowly started getting way more opportunities to actually do it as a job. So I switched my normal job to part-time for about six months. And in those six months, then it developed enough for me to just leave everything and, you know, just do photography. And that's when, you know, I started traveling and just put more and more effort into photography. So I'd say it started from, from a frustration that I wasn't happy and then it turned out to be a really good thing for me. So I guess, you know, something from something bad, I, I managed to get something good out of it. So, and I feel like all great stories begin this way, you know, by taking the risk, the challenge to yeah. just, uh, like Stuart said here, to, the, taking the leap, basically. Yeah, uh, it but it is scary. It is scary. But honestly, I think if you love it enough and, really passionate about it and put enough time into it you could anyone can do it anyone can do it especially in an industry like today where you know you could be creating a video and it could go viral and that's it like now everyone knows your name so it's just yeah. it's uh it's down to the creator i think to put in the, the time and the hours and just share as much as possible um and yeah i think by sharing as well you you'll find your own voice because at the start it is hard to understand what sort of photography you want to do or what sort of, um, you know, uh, what sort of stuff you want to take pictures of. But then with time, um, you'll find it. Yeah, beautiful. <laughs> That's really nice to know. And right now we're adding the... Yeah, the so all, all the writing. So it was six, uh, sorry, my imagination and then Six is my lucky number, so I just added a six-minute wait time. Um, so it's gonna be a minute. Beautiful. I'm gonna make the minute a bit smaller because normally they're not all on the same um, font. Oh, sorry, one sec. How do I get rid of that? Sorry, the bar just went over, and I can't press confirm. There we go. <laughs> So I'm just going to shift it. And yeah, so pretty happy with how the platform number turn out, turn out. I'm going to just now do the same thing for the train and I'm in the middle. I'm just going to write destiny. And we're probably going to put it at the same as the platform font. So it was, I think it was 16. Yeah. So destiny. And we're going to change the color. So we're going to select. And as you can see, we're selected to orange. Uh, for this one, I want it to be a bit more transparent, so I'm probably going to go to sort of like a grey and see what it looks like. And you know, and between all the experimentation, you know, like how long does it take you usually uh, in your workflow to edit an image in general? Um, honestly, an image like this is probably going to take me 20 minutes, half an hour, depending on how much editing and how elaborate it is the edit but 50 percent of the time my images are not so elaborated it's just literally a matter of putting it into lightroom uh, picking um, a color grid that i like and then putting into photoshop removing all distractions and that's it so i would say probably 
five to ten minutes for an image that is not elaborated. Something like this will probably be half an hour, 40 minutes, just to make sure that all the bits are in place and that everything matches the way I want it. Um, That's pretty fast. That means you don't overthink so much. You just go for it. I, <laughs> I, I tend not to, because especially because I started photography and I wasn't really much of a, uh, like, putting too much creation into Photoshop, but I feel like the more I go forward with my sort of career, I don't know, it just gives a, a personal touch to the image. Instead of just being the image, I think you can express myself, uh, express yourself like, and just put on your own twist on an image that you may, may already seen somewhere else. And you just add your own twist or your own effect or your own color grade. So I think the more things you add to it, the more personal it becomes to you. And I guess then that develops into your own signature style, your, yeah. your, all your bits and, you know, that create your own image. Um, so as you can see, we now have all the writing in place. Um, this is an image that was already done. So what's the next step is to, I'm going to add some, you can see here, some lens flares on the train and some fog underneath the train. Um, right. So you can get some PNGs like I have here from online. And literally you're gonna go over the image and place it. You will have it with a black background most of the time. So what you do is you just place it roughly in the area that you want it. And then you'll go into your blending mode, which are here on the right. And you wanna select something like screen. Yeah, which will get rid of the black lines, um, the black uh, background. Automatically, yeah. Yeah. Depending, I guess, on the background, right? Yeah, how yeah, complex yeah. the background is. Yeah, for sure. And um, so, yeah, I'll place it over the light. Um, see, for me, this is a bit too harsh at the moment. Uh, so what I'll do is probably bring the opacity down a bit just to, you know, make it a bit more realistic. And... And literally gonna go and do Control C, Control V, and create a duplicate of what I just did there, and place it over the other um, the other light. You can obviously make it smaller or bigger. I'm pretty sure I did a smaller version on the original image, so we're gonna go. I'm gonna go in and oh, sorry, there we go. I'm gonna go in and make this a bit smaller just so it's not too this taken away from the image. And then once that's done, I'm gonna bring in some fog. And I find this with, especially with fog and vignetting, I started using vignetting a lot in the last year. I feel like it brings a lot more um, focus to the image. And how, uh, sorry, just for those who are not familiar with the term, like myself. Vignetting. <laughs> Vignetting, which is like adding no, the... Uh, yeah, vignetting is adding... Like basically, a, in all four corners, there will be sort of like a black sort of faded, which will create... It's like a circle. Okay. If you imagine a sort of black circle around the image, yeah. but obviously not a very dark circle. It just makes the corners of the image a bit darker so that your eye is drawn to the middle of the image. And wow, that's, 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 that's interesting. And I know that there's two options. You can either have it black or white. Yeah, so you can either... The normal way is to do it black, and then you can invert it and obviously go the opposite way and makes the corners white. Uh, but I feel like... I never use the white one, but some people do. It's, it depends on a lot on the image that you're editing and you know what sort of results you're trying to achieve. Um, we're going to literally do the same thing. And again, with the screen blend, I'm just going to make this bigger and then drag it down so that it's a bit more faded. There we go. That's trying... So you can see where we started and sort of like you could have it like that, but I think just this, this sort of stuff adds a bit to your image and I think it can, it draws your, the viewer attention a bit more. Um, obviously you can go crazy with it and then start adding a lot more, but, um, I tend to not add too much because it can become a bit distracting again. Um, so let's just work on this. Um, so the next thing I'm going to do is what I'm, I'm going to cut up the top of the image 
so that this will create then a gap for us to go in and, and place the satellite view of Earth into the image. My computer might crash a bit, it might be a bit slow, but we'll get there. Um, Whereas we always have a backup plan for that. <laughs> Tim yeah. will be able to help us. <laughs> um, so these, I'll do this on a lasso tool. So you want to kind of zoom in quite a lot in the image. So you want to see what sort of edge you're working with. Um, and yeah, just literally slowly going and cutting all around the image so that we have a gap. And you could do this by using other tools. There is an automated tool as well that you can use, but I feel like with the lasso tool is the most precise way you can do it. It's a bit more time consuming because you have to do it manually, um, but you could do it automatically with... I feel like it's more definite though, like more, the, sorry, like the defined. More, more specific when you do it uh, like that, that manually, right? Yeah, manually, the corners will be a lot sharper and is, I think it's just a better way. And to make sure that you haven't missed. Oh, let's go back. Oh, sorry. We uh, got you distracted uh, there. <laughs> nah, don't worry. And um, yeah, I think this is the best way to make sure you don't miss anything because, yeah, yeah just double checking that you're doing it the right way. So once we have done this, we will basically removing this we're removing this building from the picture and we'll have a gap on the top of the image where right. we can actually drag and drop our satellite view fashion way, the old fashioned way because here we have like uh, tim saying the content aware trace because yeah. that's also like a tool that we could use but we're gonna be cool today we're gonna use the old-fashioned way we, uh, we're going to classic today <laughs> classic <laughs> um, but we're, we're almost there um, do you usually listen to music while you edit or that's too distracting? Um, it really depends on my mood. Sometimes I, I literally like to sit in silence and, you know, we just work on the image. Sometimes, you know, I'll just put on a coffee and just blast some music. Um, but yeah, it really depends on my mood. Um, when it's an important project, I like to do it without music. Just, yeah. just so is um, so I focus even more. Um, so we gonna then go to the image. Oh, so that's gone, and so now we have basically oh, uh, select. We have a space on top of the image where we gonna drag and drop our video. Wow. So this was downloaded. Um, you can find this on Adobe Stock as well. Um, yeah, oh, you also have like this, you have a free collection as well, uh, in case uh, people are wondering. But that, yeah, uh, right now Adobe Stock has this amazing collection of audio too in motion. It's just mm -hmm. fascinating. Um, what we're going to need for this, it is a video timeline. So you go into top, there's a window section and we find timeline. So we're going to create a timeline. Wow, this completely changes the mood of the image, like yeah. comparing and, to, the, to the first one to now. Yeah, and you're going to see once it starts moving as well, it's, <clears throat> it's just going to take on a whole new dimension. And I think he adds a lot to the image. Um, so yeah, as you can see, I'm going to make this a bit smaller. Very good. Yeah. There we go. My laptop is just dying. There. Okay. Let's hit play. Um, and then let it play. So this is probably just rendering because my laptop is not going to keep up. But as you can see, Ooh. the world is moving. And yeah, as you, it just adds a, a new layer to the image. Um, and once we'll export this, you'll see it's just a crazy difference. Um, but that's a pretty much it in terms of the Photoshop uh, structure. I'm going to show you what sort of 
exporting export settings i use yeah pretty interesting uh, in that one um where is it uh export and then render video and we're just gonna call it final version on the desktop and yeah let's render it i'm pretty sure i already have it re oh, rendered because it took a while before so i mean we can wait and then um so would which would which file would you have this in to and before like you said right yeah it's gonna be, yeah and how about i have how about exporting it to gif would that also as um, a GIF file yeah you could do that um i just feel like the mp4 gif sometimes is better for like um sort of web um posting i find that because it's just a bit lighter yeah um but just if you want the full resolution like i prefer it to do an mp4 um honestly i don't work with gif very much um so let's have a look is oh wow this is so cool yeah and also as you can see the the actual image the video that i've downloaded you can get videos that are oh what is this <laughs> opening um yeah so if you get a flatter video on top it won't have the same diff uh, the same sort of effect as you can see this video sort of adds light into it as well yeah yeah, definitely. So I think that adds even another layer to your image. So the, the world goes from nighttime to daytime instead of just being a, a spinning globe, which obviously will work, but I think yeah. slightly better with a bit of light and um, yeah. Be more love, loving the combination between, you know, moving images and a still image. That's beautiful. And, you know, I wanted to ask you, Andrea, in your biography, uh, you say that you like different and you don't settle for average. Uh, <laughs> would you like to share your insights on that one? Yeah, for sure. Um, I think it's about, you know, especially on, I see this happening a lot, for example, in the Instagram community where, you know, someone goes to a, it's almost like the way you see a photography place or, you travel to a country and you don't you just don't want to settle for the image that you already seen i think that's like kind of it's too easy like i like to sort of go there and try and find a different angle or shoot through objects or just finding a different way of looking at things that we've already seen a thousand images of because i think yeah. that's what makes it different otherwise you'll just have the same image as everyone else uh, yeah. which I think it takes away from the actual creative part of photography or just digital art in general. Um, we can obviously get inspired by people and, you know, that's how everything starts. But it's nice to add your own layer of creativity above um, your creations. Yeah, amazing. And then because, you know, in the end, we create our own trends, right? Like I know that we are obsessed with following certain trends in the creative industry, you know, just to keep up with everyone. But the beauty of it all is to experiment and create your own style. Uh, I think especially on social media, it's good to do trends and stuff because, you know, we all like numbers. We all like to grow with the numbers and stuff. But um, once you're actually able to create your own trend, that's where you see the real difference. Um, so I think a good mix of like doing trends and then also trying your own spin on stuff just so people have the opportunity of you know seeing what you're doing and you know maybe copying your sort of work and i think that's the end goal is to you know just sort of innovate our industry because mm -hmm. if we're all pushing for something new then eventually some of us will create something amazing you know what i mean exactly. yeah um, and what is what is a stereotype image for you i know that also you mentioned that you would like to to stay away from that and create your own thing so what would be you know a stereotypical image for instance um for example if you see an image that went viral on social media and you go to an image say of tower bridge in london so you yeah. see that you go to london you recreate the image for me that is a stereotypical image like you've seen it you recreated it 
So it's like, it's kind of like, I, t I, I try my best not to do that just because, yeah, as I was saying before, it just feels like too much of a copy. And um, I think it, it takes a, it defeats the purpose of art. Like um, the purpose, I think, is just to express ourselves. So if we copy someone else, then we're not expressing our own art. We're expressing someone else's. So, right. yeah. Um, I, I agree. I agree with you. It doesn't mean, like, you know, it doesn't have to look the same, but the fact that it doesn't look the same is exactly why it makes it special. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, the more the more differences, the better, I think. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. 100%. Um, Andrea, I know you mentioned that uh, you will be able to show us uh, another edit for today, perhaps. Uh, we can take a look at um, at one of the images that uh, I know that backstage we talked about that one. Yeah, for sure. So this is another thing that I like to do and what is GIFs. Uh, so it's basically a, se a sequence of images uh, put together as a video. Wow. So as you can see, this is, um, so there is another person behind the subject moving mm -hmm. the light. Um, so this is, I think, this was, let's have a look how many images this was. It was 19 images put together. Uh -huh. So the process behind this, what I normally do is I select, it all, I select all the raw images and I import those into Lightroom. Um, they probably won't import. And I noticed that they're all in raw. Yeah. You, you would always yeah. select the, the raw file. Yeah, these are all the raw files because... Oh, one second. Um, all right, let's... Um, yeah, so what I'll do is I'll go in and then select, um, I'll take one image, do an edit of the color grade that I like the most, and then um, literally copy and paste the same color correction onto the other images. Because they've been taken in a sequence, the, um, it'll be pretty much the same image. Uh -huh. So all you need to do is edit one image and then copy and paste the same settings onto the, the following 18 images, for example, in this case. Um, so this is, it doesn't look like, uh, and where was this taken? Uh, yeah. it's, a, secret it's a, location. It's kind of a secret. Yeah. I can't really tell where it is, but, but I, it is in London though. It's in London. It's in London. Yeah. Um, uh, where is it? Okay. I see, for example, what I do on this one is just add a bit more light. See, example, this image, pretty much straight out of the camera. I like the colors in this, so there's not much I want to do to it apart from already enhancing what's already there. So, for example, this blue, I feel like is a bit faded. So I'm just going to go into um, the blues here in the saturation, and I'm just going to add a bit more blue. And I'm going to put it more towards like a, a purpley blue instead of a light blue. And then... I noticed, Andrea, that, you know, in most of your work, you really like to have an authentic feel of the image. Like, you don't really play around with the colors for it to show, like, it's... Not massively. Honestly, for me, as long as there is some blue in it, I'm happy with it. Um, always. Yeah. You always want to have to be blue. Yeah, I really like blue. So, for me, it's like, it's kind of my personal touch to it. So, even if an image comes up very warm, say, if this image was like that, all I would do to it is just bring some temperature down and make sure that kind of matches what I want the views to feel. So it's like kind of a cold um, and like edgy um, metallic environment. I don't really like um, warm tones. So I always tend to go towards the blue. And yeah, so for me, it's blue all the way. Um, I'm gonna just copy the settings that I've done here. So. Controls, oh, where is it? Control C, and I'm just literally gonna copy all settings that went on this image, and then select all the rest of the images, and then Shift Command V. Or you can go and do a double click on any of the images and do a develop settings, and then paste, and that will literally do the same. That's just a shortcut. So Shift Command V to paste. Um, once we have all the images, you can, we can already see it if we go into library and put it into this view format. And if we 
hold down the, the right arrow, you can already see the kind of what we're getting. It's a bit glitchy because the computer is not keeping up, but um, you will be able to get a feel for what you're editing. So you see kind of it coming, coming together. Wow. Oh. And is there a reason why the you're showing the light? Like, because I am, I know that there's the the light effect, but then we, then we can see the light actually, like the. Yeah, it's because we did it without showing the light, and it just it feels like it's a bit random because you don't see where it's coming from. So this is almost like also creates a separation from the subject to like you know the background. So we did a second version, which is this one, where you can actually see the light coming through, and because we shot it at a quite low shutter speed, as you can see, it was a shot at one sixth of a second. The light, this is actually a light stick, so it's actually very thin, but because it's shot at a slow shutter speed and the camera takes a while to close the shutter, you will see where the light has been and it leaves sort of a trace behind the light. Um, so yeah, seeing the light, I think he just added a bit more to the image. Also because as you can see here, even this on his own as a as a one frame, I think this will work as well. It just this halo behind his head is quite cool. This is what originally I wanted, but because we had a, a sequence of images, then I was like, oh, why don't do why don't we do a gift? Um, so that's kind of how this came along. And yeah, once you have exported those, and I'll just show you how I export it. Um, so you go and file export. And you'll just make a folder. For example, I did a folder here called GIF on my desktop. Oh, desktop. Uh, I've already exported it. And I normally call image one, two, three, four. So you, you just rename it with a sequence and then you give it a name. And then with the sequence, you'll have, you know, just a Lightroom will just give it a number automatically. So you know what's the sequence of the images and where they all go because obviously if you get these images mixed up it doesn't really have the same effects because the light needs to have a flow um so yeah once you click export you have something that looks like this so we have image 1 to 19 and you want to import those into photoshop i've already done that and see you just have all different layers so for this case is 19 layers yeah and you want to make sure that for this one as well you have a timeline um where is it yeah a video timeline on so that you can actually create a video but how important it is then to name your layers in this case because otherwise yeah yeah because once they get mixed up you are pretty screwed because <laughs> To find it back, also this one is actually not too bad. But say you're doing a gif of a of a motion, for example, someone pouring a glass of water or mm -hmm. anything like that, that needs to be smooth. Um, if you lose track on uh, where the frame go, it just doesn't work. It just glitches and goes back and forward. <laughs> um, what I like to do is I, I like to make um, each image of two frames or three frames, depending on how fast I want the the gifs to be. So in this case, I've done it all of them on three frames. So each image is going to play for three frames. And this is kind of what we're going to get. Nice. So once you do that, again, you go into export. And because Instagram also, let's say this is going on Instagram, Instagram automatically loops at the videos. Um, so Actually, the shorter the better, because that means that if it's a three second video, it would just loop automatically, which means yeah. more views. So keep that in mind. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, definitely. And not to forget the viewers attention. Span yeah. These days, <laughs> more than more than two seconds. That's, yeah, it's just, uh, very hard to keep people on, you know. Um, but yeah, so this will be the, your final um, um, the final image. I'll say a video. Amazing. So, you know, but have you always been interested in moving images or I believe, of course, like any photographer, you know, you would start with, with just photos and static images, but when was, when did your passion and moving images began and when did you start experimenting with that? 
Honestly, I feel like um, after a couple of years of doing just stills, um, I wanted just to bring my images alive. And but I've never been interested too much into video. Uh, so I wanted sort of like a shorter format. So as we said, three seconds, four seconds, where I can literally, you know, instead of having a still subject, you can have that subject doing some sort of movement or just it brings an extra layer to the image again. And yeah, sort of like I started, you know, taking more interest into it. And obviously I didn't develop this technique. I saw it from somewhere else and another create a London creator called oh, I can't remember his name. But anyways, another London creator. I saw he was doing it with these. Um, he did it for um for a sunglasses company and he was doing the motion of someone putting the glasses on. But because you have so many so much more control, because obviously you take in you know, 20 images where you can go in every single same single image and do a color correction. There's a lot more depth to it. Instead of a video, a video and color correcting it is not as good as color correcting 20 images and having, you know, a two second video. So because of that, I started experimenting more and more. And honestly, it's what got me most of my jobs in the last two years because they looked a bit different. So clients were like, oh, we want, we want the gifts. Um, you know, just because obviously everyone was doing stills, but not many people were doing gifts. So it kind of differentiated me from everyone else. And because of that, I started getting more jobs. And so I started putting more effort into gifts. So it's, yeah, that's kind of how it, it developed. It first was more for me, as in, I want to just create, you know, more uh, appealing image and then it turned into more of even on the business side of things um more more customer wanted it you know for their own projects um so it was actually pretty good to start doing moving images yeah but that's so interesting to know because we bring this up a lot in our adobe live sessions you know like trying new things that drive clients to you and yeah that's it's almost exciting for the client and that's why they book you and not someone else because it's also it feels like you are trying something new which makes you feel like you update with you update with everything that's happening on social media so it just gives more confidence to your customer or to your client to just say yeah i'm gonna book him because, you know, he's just trying something new. It's a bit more exciting than just going in and just taking, you know, stills, which you will always, always do. It's just an extra that you can, you know, propose to your clients and, you know, just it shows more, um, more will of working and just you know, overall more interest in the brand as well. And it, it helps them develop their brand because obviously they're working with a creator that is more into this new stuff and, yeah, I think it's just good overall to to try and test um, new things and yeah. test it on businesses as well. And yeah, definitely because there's also like this golden rule that uh, I hear a lot, which is don't put things on your portfolio that you don't want to be hired for. Basically, like always put things that will because in the end, yeah, of course we all need client works, right? And we all need. Uh, like revenue out of it, but you also want to be creating things that you love, right? And and out of your out of passion, out of why you began this career in the first place. I I, I sort of found them myself because when I started doing it, then most of my photo shoots were, you know, I ended up making twenty gifts in one photo shoot, which is a lot. If you had to do another three hundred images on top, so at that point I was like, why wow, this is getting out of hand. So what I started doing is I started, first of all, limiting the amount of gifts that I was giving to a client. So I think it's about balance. So first you just push it a lot and then you sort of bring it down and like, okay, this is now, how how many am I, am I okay to make for every photo shoot? I don't want to make more than five. So I'm going to propose five to the client because otherwise it just gets out of hand and you end up, you know, just, working on stuff that you don't enjoy working on as you said then it's it's not the it's not why we do what we do i don't think so it defeats the purpose exactly um, yeah and you know and we have gareth here he's super in love with after effects he's asking if you've ever experimented with the app before for for to create moving images 
I have not, and I'm not going to lie, it scares me a bit, but I'm definitely going to look into it. Um, as I said, the whole, to me at least, video stuff is kind of like, I always see it as a much bigger project, a much bigger time consuming project. And it's not really what I love is I like creating, you know, I like to focus on one image or a short format video. Um, I don't like to spend too much time on my projects um, just because, you know, I like a lot of things and I want to work on a lot of things. And if I spend, you know, a month working on a piece of art, which is not wrong, it's just like, it's just not what I like. Um, I like to be working on different stuff, on different projects, on different sort of like, you know, I could be taking pictures of a car or a person. I don't want to be stuck in one thing. So I don't tend to take big video projects on because it's very time consuming. Um, but After Effects is definitely something that I considered for, you know, even creating 3D images or like, you know, moving perspectives in, in, a, in a 2D image. Um, but I'm not a hundred percent familiar with it. I will definitely have a look into it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, right, especially with, and with, cause you know, I'd always, always releasing these new features. Yeah. I, I was, I personally was scared of using after effects back in, in university when I was, uh, studying for my graphic design degree, but it's actually gotten so much easier right now. And every time I see like how like tips and, and and these new tools i'm like i wish these existed before uh -huh. so it's like but yeah okay. I, th I think like it's just experimenting and just getting to know how I'm each app one. works yeah definitely. i guess it's sort of like what we said before about um photoshop as well because replacing a sky in photoshop um used to be something that scared people i think and now it's just literally one click and like it helps a lot. You might have to go in and tweak a few things, but you know, it does most of the, the work for you. So it becomes a very easy way of, you know, changing your images and actually getting creative. Yeah. And, you know, we have around 10, less than 10 minutes left. And I wanted to ask you, Andrea, uh, like, Obviously, you are seeing your development from the first image you took, or photo, sorry, from the first photo you took until now. Um, how has this process been for you um, in terms of, you know, like, has it opened up your mind a bit? I mean, uh, you know, discovering your styles, um, like comparing right now your work from the past, uh, do you have any insights on that to share? I feel because, you know, we have so many young viewers, you know, watching us and people who recently graduated and and especially if someone wants to jump in into a career like photography, that's that should be scary and challenging maybe. So I'm interested to see how has that have been for you? Um, for me, I don't know. The, the main thing I see um in my career at least is uh the more i take photos the better i get so if i had one tip for anyone starting or getting to photography is create something every day go out every day take pictures every day no matter how how they look just learn the camera learn your city learn every angle learn do you know what i mean it's just getting confident and comfortable with the basics and i think once you at least for me, once I knew how to use a camera properly and, you know, just sort of, I developed and even going back to the same places, for example, I've been shooting in London for eight years now and going back to places and, you know, just finding new angles just because I've been interacting with different things. I see things different. I maybe have a, a different lens to when I started. So there's all these different factors that, if you keep shooting and you keep going back at it and you, you know, keep sort of like creating you, I think your brain just opens up and be like, okay, we can then try this. Or you don't just go to a place and take the picture. You just go there and think of how you can make it look different. So I feel like the beginning is a lot more quantity and then it slowly starts becoming more like you can almost imagine the shot in your head before you actually go and do it you can be walking around and like, oh, I can see that leading line into, you know, that bridge or 
textures what i see a lot is like i can be walking around and i look at the floor and say oh, wow that is an awesome texture or you see it on a wall things that before photography or before taking pictures i just wouldn't notice so it's just like by doing photography i think you just start thinking differently so the more the more you are there with your camera the better i would say it, it really develops the way you think and you look at things Amazing. That's that's such a nice tip. Yeah, and I hope everyone watching us today will will get the most out of it. I know it's it's hard these days to get yeah. out there, um, but hopefully things you know will get better. People will be able to go out and just experiment. Um, and for uh, what cameras are you using, um, Andrea? Well, how from where? What did you start, oh. and what are you using now? I start... <laughs> that's a crazy question. I know, but. <laughs> yeah, no, it's... Actually, not that many cameras. I think I started on a Canon 750D um, entry level camera. I think it's $350 or pounds. Um, and then moved on to Nikon or Nikon, how do you want to call it? Um, I've, at first, I think we kind of all have it as a photographer. We all, I loved cameras and the gear more than actually taking the pictures. Um, so I loved my camera and all the lenses and I got into, really into like looking at what lenses to use. So at first was, yeah, uh, 750D, then uh, Nikon 7, 7, 7, 7, 5 something, 750D? No, A50D. And, um, and then I switched to Sony and then got an A7R Mark II, um, which I had up until... A year ago um and then i switched on to a7r and they said sony a7r mark three um which is not even is not the latest um of the best so sometimes we can get stuck on like what camera but honestly i don't think it really matters especially now when we live in a in a time where like social media you could literally do everything on your phone you could grow a social media on your phone you can create on your phone you can share it on your phone um it's really the camera thing is important when you you know there's still a stereotype of showing up to a job where you know your client sees you on a phone and it's like mm, why are you using a phone but they don't they just don't understand it because that phone can actually bring way more value than a camera to their business um yeah. so it's about educating also the customer and you know do a mix and but yeah i don't think the camera matters to a certain um, a certain level but then it's more like you know what sort of the vision and sort of the concept behind what you're creating but yeah, yeah. the reason i ask is because you know changing cameras did you feel like this affected the outcome of the photos that you're taking i mean obviously yes but just it's, interested to hear your point of view on this one it's more like the workflow than the actual final results because the uh, you can get the same image if you have the uh, you know kind of you can create as the same image on a canon 750d or on the most expensive sony it's just about how fast you can do it if you're obviously on a job and you know there's so many more buttons on a expensive camera and it's just easier to use but that doesn't mean that you can't get the same result with the cheaper camera it's just your workflow just becomes better, but also your back is not going to like it because everything becomes a lot heavier. Um, so yeah, there is downsides to it. Um, I like to keep it simple. I, I own probably five lenses, four lenses, mm -hmm. and that's what I should most of my work with. So if you, if you, should we give these lenses so that everyone knows maybe? Um, okay. Yeah. That's they like focal length. I don't know. So like, I shoot a lot of my, uh, most of my work on a 12 to 24 millimeter. So very wide because I, I shoot a lot of architecture and, you know, urban photography. So the wider you go, the better. Then I have a 16 to 35, which is kind of similar lens, but you can also use it for, you know, more of a portrait -y look. Um, then a 24, 24 to 70, which is really good for portraits and more like detail shots. And then a 90, uh, 90 micro. And the micro is probably the most unique lens just because you can get so close to objects and things. Um, and yeah, it just brings a different perspective to it. But yeah, so to cover the whole range, I don't 
it's very rare that I shoot above 90 millimeter. Um, just in very few occasion, I rented a 70 to 200, which is very zoomed in. But most of the time, my work is wider. So awesome! That's so good to know. Thank you, thank you, Andrea, for sharing all this knowledge with us today. It's been lovely having you, and you know, seeing some of the tips and tricks that you've done with your photography. Uh, thank you again for joining us. It's been lovely. I want to thank everyone who watched us today and the, the beautiful people on the chat. Uh, don't forget that we have a Discord channel that you can uh, join and keep the conversation going. Just wanted to tell you all that we are live every week from Monday, Wednesday, Friday. And I have the amazing schedule here with me. On Monday, we will have Photoshop and Illustration with Iga Oliviak. And on Wednesday, next week, we will have the second part uh, with Josh Peters, uh, Destination Imagination. And then on Friday, I will be back with the Creative Mentorship Program by Off Academy and Adobe with the beautiful Lisa Innebase from Studio Dunbar. So I can't wait to see you all uh, next week uh, with, with, the, uh, with the rest of the hosts, of, of course. Uh, have a lovely Friday. And thank you again, Andrea. And take care, everyone. Thank you everyone for watching. Thank you.